So uh, in the Valley, we've had a class called Perspectives. Uh, some of you who have, have been a part of it, and there's this big, thick reader that you've got to read. Um, and uh, it's full of different articles. It's a, it's a missions class. Uh, um, and uh, there's an article in it uh, written by a guy named Ralph Winter, and it is called Reconsecration to a Wartime, Not a Peacetime Lifestyle. And it focuses on the Queen Mary, one of the transport ships in World War II. And it says, the Queen Mary, lying in repose in the harbor at Long Beach, California, is a fascinating museum of the past. Used both as a luxury liner in peacetime and a troop transport during the Second World War. Its present status as a museum, the length of three football fields, affords a stunning contrast between the lifestyles appropriate in peace versus war. On one side of the partition, you see the dining room reconstructed to depict peacetime. Table set in was... Um, the peacetime table set in that was appropriate to the wealthy patrons of high culture for whom a dazzling array of knives and forks and spoons held no mysteries. On the other side of the partition, the evidence of a wartime austerities are in sharp contrast. One metal tray with indentations replaces 15 plates and saucers. Bunks not just double, but eight tiers high explain why the peacetime complement of 3,000 individuals gave way to 15,000 people on board in wartime. How repugnant to the peacetime masters this transformation must have been. To do it took a national emergency, of course. The survival of a nation depended on it. The essence of the Great Commission today is that the survival of many millions of people many millions of people, depends on its fulfillment. Today, we are in the midst of a rebellion. We are engaged in a war. There is a rebellion against the God of the universe. And through God's purposes and his will, God has chosen us to be witnesses. He has chosen us of his plan to conquer the rebellion of the human heart. Re a rebellion that seeks to raise our own glory above the glory of the Lord, and a rebellion that seeks to oppose God in its action. This rebe rebellion took place in all of humanity from the moment Adam sinned. But God has chosen you and me to be a part of his purposes to create a people unto himself to show his power where once man opposes God, now through Jesus Christ, man may worship the one true God. And may all the peoples of the earth worship the one true God so that the whole earth might be filled with his glory. You might be wondering, what does this have to do with Genesis 11? We see in Genesis 11, the continuation really, of the rebellion against God, where man chose rather than to obey God's commission to fill the earth, God or the, these people chose to stay in one place and to build a tower to reach to the heaven in order to make a name unto themselves rather than a name unto God. So Genesis 11 tells us of this story. It says in verse one, it says, now the whole earth had one language and one speech. We would have one ancestor, Adam and Eve, and uh, it makes sense that everyone would speak the same language up until this point. I mean, why speak Mandarin when you could speak American English? No, I'm joking. <laughs> and it came to pass, verse two, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Shinar would, is kind of synonymous of the land of Babylon, you know, where Nebuchadnezzar was from, where the uh, Judeans were taken captive, uh, present-day Iraq. They spoke one language, as I said, American English. No, I'm just joking. But they chose to live and to dwell in the land of Shinar. Okay, Genesis 9 verse 1 says, 
Uh, this, this is a promise uh, or a commission made uh, by God to Noah after the great flood. It says, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So this command is given, and it was reiterated in verse 7 of chapter 9. It says, And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. So God desires to fill the earth from, from Noah and uh, continuing forward in the, in the generations to follow, his desire and his command to, the, the, to those generations was to fill the earth, to multiply and fill it. Okay, so that every corner of the world would know and worship God. So as they followed God and as they uh, looked to him, they would continue and fill the earth and the entire earth would be full of the worship of God. This is God's desire we see that throughout the, the Old Testament. And I chose a couple of verses, just rapid fire right here, just to show us that God intends to fill the earth with his glory. Numbers 14, 21, as, as God rebuked the Israelites, he kind of inserted in, into his rebuke against the Israelites. He says in verse 21, he says, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Psalm 70, 70, 72, verse 19 says, and blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. We, we know that God will one day fill the earth experience, experientially with his glory. He'll even do this through his judgment. Habakkuk 2, 12 through 14 says this. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes city by iniquity, Behold, it, is it not of the Lord of hosts that peoples labor to feed the fire and nations weary themselves in vain? Verse 14 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We'll see one day, even through God's judgment, that every nation, tribe, and tongue will bow before the great name of Jesus Christ. So we, we can establish, and, and these are just a few samplings from uh, the Old Testament, that uh, God desires to fill the earth with a heartfelt worship of his glory. Let the nations be glad. But if we stop at verse 2, if we just were just to have 11, 1 and 2, we, we could say not so bad. In order to fill the earth, these, these people traveling from the east and, and uh, going and they, they dwell in the land of Shinar, um, in order to fill the earth, some have to stay, right? So someone, to fill the earth, someone had to stay in Shinar, right? Um, but some would have to go, but there's going to be some that stay, right? Um, verse 3 says, this is kind of where we we begin the, the trouble here. We say in verse three, it says that, then they said to one, other, one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. So ad advances in technology. Verse four says, and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make, it, make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So they said that, you know, they got some advances in technology. They were starting to feel themselves. They're like, we're pretty smart. Let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. What did God tell Noah? Go be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they said, nope, lest we be scattered across the whole earth, we're going to build a tower that we could stay, stay put. And so the rebellion was both in action. We see their action saying that we're going to stay here. We're going to build ourselves a tower and we're going to stay. But their, their rebellion was also in their attitude. They said, let us make a name for ourselves isn't this the root of pretty much all of our sin? Let's make a name for ourselves. I'm the one who gets to decide what I get to do. That's the root right here. It's the, the, their attitude is one of pride. It's one of saying, I'm going to make a name for myself. 
we always do what we want to do. And they wanted to make a name for themselves. So their action was in line with their attitude, their attitude of rebellion. And within each one of us, there's a person, we're born within each person, there is a rebel inside of us that seeks to fill the earth with our glory rather than God's. Emperors from Nebuchadnezzar to Alexander the Great, from Julius Caesar to Napoleon, they've, they've been driven mad by the desire to make their name great in all the earth. Now, you and me, we might not be Julius Caesar, um, and there might not even be a Julius Caesar present on the earth, but in some way, every person born has a sin, sin desire that desires to make themselves great in the place of God. We desire independence from God, where we get to call the shots. Where we say, I know God said, fill the earth. They said, I know God said, fill the earth, but we're going to stay right here. And this is especially dangerous when uh, it's not checked within our, our hearts. And it's especially dangerous within church leadership. Okay, and I'm not talking about anyone here, here of course, because we're all perfect. <laughs> uh, but because of fame and outward success, pastors and church leaders can drift from God glorification to self glorification. And this drift, it may not be totally perceivable to the individual. It's that slow drift where, where you start and you, you start for seeking for the glory of God, but then you start listening to your own PR, right? You start listening to your own fame. And, and, and over time, it's like, you know what? I am actually pretty good at this. And oh yeah, look at the, look at the outward success, you know? And, 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 you, can, it, and, and you look at these uh, pastors who pastor churches of thousands of people. That's a dangerous place to be. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong to have a really large church. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's dangerous, right? Because you can start to believe your own press. And, 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 and one of the things, this is kind of a somewhat of a side note, that we have to be careful of. We have to be careful when we look at like the celebrity pastors of our day, the people that we really like. They're not everything they look like on, on the big screen, right? And, and I've got my list of five guys that I love and I listen to, and I, I probably have too high of a view of them, right? You might have a list of five different people, and you might not like my five people, right? <laughs> That's okay. But we have to realize there are men and, and women that they struggle with their own sin, they have their own issues, their own weaknesses. And there's only one true hero. That's Jesus Christ. He's the one who gets the glory. And so we see, we see churches and pastors struggle in the face of, of scandal. And one of the reactions that churches can have, especially these big churches and big organizations have, is they go into PR mode. When a, when a scandal takes place and, and a... And a uh, a church leader falls in a gross immorality, you know, a sexual abuse or, you know, whatever. You know, the list could go on. Churches have a temptation to protect their own brand above the glory of God. And so they, they, they start to seek, how can we spin the story to make ourselves good and to protect what we have built for ourselves? A dangerous place to be. Let the brand fall and the name of the Lord Jesus be glorified. But there will always, uh, you know, it doesn't just uh, stop with church leaders. It, it goes into pretty much every area of our life. You know, parents, uh, you know, I, I've got a daughter and, and we can be tempted to just try to, uh, you know, use our daughter, like my cute, cute little daughter. She's the cutest thing ever. And I'm like, well, if she's cute, then that must say something about me. No, it doesn't. Okay, it says something about my wife. Okay, but we can use other, the, we can use kids as, as a means to show how good we are. And, and, and you could go on, your career, you know, what, your friends you have, you, all these things reflect back to how good you are, right? And I think one of the things we have to realize is that this is probably something we're always going to struggle with until we die. So I'm not trying to get everyone to 
get into a place of morbid introspection where you start hyperanalyzing every action you make and say, well, I can't serve in kids ministry because there's some angle in which it might benefit me or might make me look like a good person. There's always going to be that temptation. But I think just even realizing the fact that there is that rebel inside of us that says, I'm going to make a name great for myself. Just recognizing that there's something inside me, my flesh, that wants to make itself great. That is a great first step in, in giving God the glory. Because you recognize, I, this is a dangerous part of me. And, and I don't need to just focus on suppression saying, no, I'm going to not do anything because it might point back to myself, but rather I can seek to glorify God. The answer is not just what I put off, it's what I put on and seeking to glorify the name of the Lord. So we should be people who, our, our desire, rather than just being morbidly introspective about ourselves and our motives, but rather we should focus on the glory of God in making his name great. And if success might come your way, May God receive greater glory. And so that's, that's the, you know, the danger that we all face, but also the answer to that is not to just not do anything, but it is to glorify God and to seek and desire after him. So there will always be a desire for self-glory, but let's be those who glorify God and look for that day in which we will ultimately experience his glory. So get to know God. Get to know him as glorious. And if you recognize he is so glorious and he's so marvelous and he's my greatest treasure, then your self and your self-image fades into, the, into the, the mist. So we have a rebellion and attitude that is present on the plains of Sinar in, in Babel. But we also have a rebellion of action. Their attitude led to action. They said, let us build a city and a tower. Why did they want to build a city and a tower? Well, maybe because, I don't know for sure, uh, but maybe because they uh, wanted to escape a potential flood. Okay, they built it out of tar and mortar, waterproof, touched the heavens so they'd be above the heavens, right? Maybe, maybe that was their, their thought. Uh, interestingly enough, and kind of a side note, uh, there's a Greek historian, Herodotus. I'm not so sure if I'm saying his name right. He actually recorded in 400 years before Christ, a magnificent tower in the city of Babylon. So I don't know if it was a replica of the original one or if the original one actually made it all the way to the fourth century BC, but it's gone now. Uh, it, it fell. But what we see is that they were trying to make this magnificent tower, okay, maybe to even just escape a potential flood, which is ironic because God promised that I'm never going to flood, the, he, he's never going to flood the earth again. So it was possibly, and I don't know for sure, but it was possibly a, a di direct contradiction of God's promises, a di direct disbelief in God. But we see that they, they, the reason why they built a tower and, and they explained, them, explained it to themselves or in, in this text where it said, uh, you know, let's build ourselves a city and a tower to make our name great, but also we don't want to be scattered. We, it was direct opposition to God's command to fill the earth and multiply. So they say, let's, let's commit this action in order to disobey God. Man certainly thinks it is so powerful. We, we think we're the bee's knees, okay? And we can look at all the things that we have built and advances in science and technology and, you know, the list could go on. And we're like, man, we're pretty cool. We, we have done away with a need for God. God looks at that and he laughs. His purposes will be fulfilled in, despite man's perceived power, Verse five says, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they, are all, and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us. Notice he said, let us. Let us make man in our image in Genesis 1, verse 7. Come, let us, just a 
Trinity side note there. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Verse eight. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. So God's purposes are accomplished despite the efforts of man. Christian, you need, I need, to be reminded that in, fa- in the face of man's rebellion, God will frustrate the plans of the wicked. His purposes will be accomplished. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. AI can't do it. AI technology can't do it. Advances in world government, blah, blah, blah. All these things might look powerful on the outside, on the veneer, but God can frustrate the power of the wicked. And you can trust in the power of Christ to protect you, to guide you, and to ultimately bring you into your inheritance that we find in Christ. Verse nine, therefore, its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. We see man's rebellion in Babylon. We see God accomplishing his purposes. Man's rebellion against God is, is in many parts of scripture. It is uh, ba- the Babylon is a consistent theme and a consistent representation of man's rebellion against God. Babylon is consistent throughout the Bible as, as a representation of man's rebellion against God. Revelation 19, 21 through 24 tells us of how God will one day deal with Babylon. Revelation 19, 21 says, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of, of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. Nor craftsmen or any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of earth. For by your sorcery, all nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. What we see in the God's ultimate dealing with Babylon is that he wins. And despite Babylon and, and, and what Babylon represents, God's rebellion against man, looking like it has an outward power, what we see is that God will one day deal with Babylon. And this is why we as Christians can say, as Romans 12, 19 through 21 says, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. head. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. We can trust in the power and authority of our Lord. That he will deal with evil. He will ultimately deal with the rebellion of mankind. Let's trust him. So back to Genesis chapter 11. And in interest of time, I'm actually not going to read verses uh, 10 through 32, okay? Uh, I'll just kind of summarize this, okay? Verses 10 through 32 show us the lineage of Shem to Abraham. Genesis chapter 9, Noah blesses Shem, okay? He blesses Shem because Ham behaved uh, improperly towards Noah and Shem behaved properly towards Noah. We don't have time to get into it. 10 through 32 show us this direct lineage between Shem and Abraham. 
the continuation of God's redemptive purpose from Noah and Shem to Abraham. God's always had a plan. He's always had a purpose. He's been preserving a people unto himself from Shem to the present day and before that. Genesis 9, 26 through 27 says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be a servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So then that brings us all the way to Abraham, they're kind of the recipient of this blessing. And we see God appear to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And we're going to finish looking at Genesis 12, 1 through 3. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God, because of his purpose, because of the purpose of his will, chooses Abraham to make a great nation. Deuteronomy 7.7 7 says, The Lord did not set his love on you or, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all the peoples. And God chose a 75-year-old man to give a promise to that 25 years later would be fulfilled through one child named Isaac. And he was going to bless all the nations through that one man. God chose what was weak. He didn't choose a 22-year-old and, you know, 20-year-old uh, husband and wife to, you know, give 15 kids to, right? He, that's not what he chose. He chose what was impossible. And he said, I'm going to show my power and my great name through these people. And I'm going to, not because of anything that they've done, I'm going to make th his name great. I'm going to make Abraham's name great, so that his power and his purpose and his glory would be shown. God loves to prove his power through the weak things of the world. And this is what we all got to realize. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 31. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put sh to shame the wise. I praise the Lord for this verse. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put sh to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as, as it is written, he who glorif glories, let him glory in the Lord. God chose Abraham. God chose you and me as a recipient of his redemptive purpose so that through Abraham and through you and me, not because we're strong or not because we were more mighty than everybody else around us, but he chose us who were weak so that through him, his name might be made great. Through his work, his name might be made great and all the nations would be blessed. Galatians 3 13 through 14. I want to invite you to just read Galatians 3, but we're just going to focus on these two verses. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Galatians go, goes on to say that the, the promise made to Abraham, the promised seed that was, that was reiterated throughout Gen the book of Genesis, that would be ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ coming, all the nations would be blessed. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. God has saved you and me. And he has given us his Holy Spirit. 
so that we might be adopted into his family. Oh, the glories of being in Christ. We are a part of God's family. We are given an inheritance in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 says uh, that we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Why? It ends with this phrase, to the praise of his glory. That we, you and me, might worship the one true God. But brother and sister in Christ, might I remind you that we're brought into God's family. We're, just, we're, we're in line with the promise given to Abraham to bless to all the nations through Abraham's seed that would ultimately be Jesus Christ. But just as the descendants of Noah were given a command, we also have been given a command. The descendants of Noah received a command to, fill, to multiply and fill the earth. But Matthew 28, 18 through 20, gives us a command. It's not a suggestion. Matthew 28 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. The question today is, do we desire to see the glory of God fill the earth? Only in the worship and desire of the one true God can man truly be satisfied. And the world around us really, really needs God. And it's not just the world around us here in Bozeman, our neighbors and our friends. Yes, they need God and they really, really need it. But we've also been given a command to go to all the nations. And I, I, I know this church here, we have a heart to see the nations reached. So I, I realize I'm preaching to the choir. Amen, let's, let's do it. But I just want to continue to encourage us. There's at least two billion people on the planet who are considered unreached. Between two and three billion people. That's a quarter to one third of the people on the earth are considered unreached. What does it mean to be unreached? It doesn't mean that they're just, you know, living a licentious life, getting drunk all the time, going to parties. That's not what it means. To be unreached means they will never even meet a Christian unless we as God's people go out of our way to reach them. Let me introduce you to the IMAC people. Two million people spread across five countries in Central Asia and no, virtually no believers that we know of. No, and, and virtually no one actively trying to reach them. And there's many people groups like this. Three million people, four million people who they speak a distinct language and there's no one in their language to say salvation belongs to the lamb. Yet, and this is where it gets a little bit sobering, most missionaries end up going to places that are already reached. Most missions money goes to people who already have a witness to them, a local church. Us, for each one of us, we have a mission to go into our community, to go to our coworkers, to go and share the gospel. Whether or not you're paid as a, you know, a, a, a on-staff church, church individual, you know, a, your vocational ministry. Whether or not you're a vocational ministry or not, we all have a mission to go and share the gospel with our coworkers, our friends, our family. So let's be about that. But let's not just build our tower here. Let's not just circle the wagons here. We also need to be excited about the Great Commission. It's not a this or that. 
Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. It doesn't say be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and once you've reached Jerusalem, then go to Judea, and then once you've reached Judea, and everybody in Judea is saved, go to Samaria, and then once you've reached that region, go to the ends of the earth. We'd still be in Jerusalem. It says, and. So we're to be witnesses in all of these places at the same time. And that's our role. And so how can we be a part of this? How can we obey the Great Commission? Well, first, it's by witnessing to those that you're around. Desiring to see your neighbors worship God. But secondly, you know, and I'm just going to give you a list. It's not an exhaustive list. But we can be excited about seeing the gospel go forth to the nations. Just being excited about that is awesome right? Where we, you, we can create, a, and we have created this. I'm not saying we, this isn't present here at Calvary Chapel Bozeman. I'm excited about what's present here. We can be excited about seeing the gospel go forth to the nations. I hope today has at least demonstrated to you that the Great Commission is in line with what God has been doing throughout history. That God has desired to see all nations praise his name. To every, see every corner of the earth exalt Jesus as the one true savior. So we can be excited about seeing the gospel go forth to the nations. We can come alongside those who are going through praying for them. It, you know, it's not going to be these people, the Imok people in Central Asia are not going to be reached just through man's effort alone. We need to be praying that the God of the universe would break the spiritual darkness over their eyes. We can be giving financially and supporting uh, those who are going. We can be taking care of practical needs for them. You know, maybe it just means going in and checking in. Hey, what do you need? What can I do for you practically here in Bozeman as you go to the nations? You know, and, and there's practical needs that you can, you can uh, fulfill for those who are going. But we can also welcome unreached people groups here in Bozeman, Montana. There are unreached people groups at MSU, meaning people from India or Central Asia who they came here for school. May they not leave Bozeman without hearing the gospel message. Talk to Lauren Helsby about that. I'll just throw that out there. We can also go. And not everybody's going to go. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we all need to leave up and move to Central Asia. But some may. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, it might take you a long time to get there. It might take you seven years. You might have to learn three languages. It might be hard, but that's why they're unreached. They're not unreached because it is easy to get to them. They're unreached because it's hard. And it, it takes, and there's a lot of bumps and a lot of trials in the way. But it's worth it. It's worth it because the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. And God's not, this is not just a message that, hey, God is in need of you. And without you, he's not going to be able to accomplish his purposes. The last five minutes might have suggested otherwise, but that is not what I'm saying. There's a promise of God that every tribe and every nation will say salvation belongs to the Lord. Revelation 7, 9 through 10 says this. After these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And this what is motivated in us. This is what we should desire. Because there will always be a need. And, and the need is too great for one person to fulfill. But we have the privilege to be a part of what God is doing. In his sovereignty, he will accomplish this. This verse will come to pass. But just as his sovereignty was present in, in uh, Genesis 11, and he filled the earth despite man's efforts, we can be a part of what he is doing 
And we can be his witnesses to all the nations that through, through the line of Abraham, through Jesus Christ, all nations of the earth might be blessed. Man is in rebellion against God. Man seeks to exalt its own name. Man seeks to oppose God in their actions, in their attitudes. But that's why they need a savior. That's why you and me, those who have been redeemed and brought into God's family, in the lineage of the line of Abraham, through Jesus Christ, we can be a part of what he is doing, both here and to the corners of the earth, that the glory of the Lord might fill the earth. And man can say, glory to be to God. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray that you, first off, Lord, I just want to pray that you would break the rebel in me and in each one of us that seeks to exalt our own name that it seeks to oppose you in our actions and in our deeds and our attitudes. Lord, I need to be broken, Lord, and I realize that. Lord, I need, I need you in your loving kindness, Lord, to sanctify me and make me Lord, more like you. And I thank you that your grace and your kindness lead us to repentance that you didn't cast us off, but that you saved us and you brought us into your family. But Lord, we, we don't want to be like the people who tried to build a tower in the plain of Shinar, the Tower of Babel. Lord, we don't want to just walk in disobedience to you, Lord. Help us to, help us to take the gospel, Lord, to our friends and our neighbors, our coworkers, Lord, whoever you would bring in front of us, Lord, pray that you give us boldness. But Lord, I also just pray that you would use our fellowship here to reach the nations. Lord, and we thank you for how you've done that, Lord. And you've given perseverance in the midst of hardship. And you've, um, Lord, you've given us faithful men and women who have just uh, gone and, and shared the gospel, Lord. And so we thank you for every uh, witness to unreached people groups that have have in some way, shape, or form, been connected with our body, Lord. And we just pray that you, um, you would continue to use us, Lord, because we are excited about one day seeing people from every tribe, nation, and tongue praising your name. May that day come quickly, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.